I was just, the last time I glanced over at the screen, I thought, well, we got to keep playing the music because there hasn't been a lot of coloring. And then I look over and... There's coloring! There's cephalopod coloring. Yay! Cephalopod coloring. Amazing. Why Amazing. Well done. Learn English. So... It's ridiculous. <laughs> We, we had a bit of fun today, this morning, when we realized that um, somebody who shares the 1070 Dropbox decided to delete their folder, <laughs> probably not realizing that it deletes everyone's folder when you do that. Uh, and so now we are mad dashing desperately trying to recover all of the 1070 files. 863 files. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Deleted. <laughs> um, and I think. How's your day going? Yeah, and I think I think given who it was, because like Dropbox keeps a record. I, I name and shame. No, <laughs> I firmly believe that they had no idea the we know their name. of their action. We know, we know their, their name. We know who you are. <laughs> anyway, so there's that. Um, so that's fun. Um. Uh. Uh, back up and save things. That's why we do everything on Dropbox so that we can start to recover these files. But we'll see. We'll see. Stuff will get lost. Did you all get into your courses? Did you get into your courses? I hope so. Yeah. Yes. All right. The one thing that I will tell you about enrollment is if you see that it's full, they may open up new spots. They kind of do this rolling enrollment in order to balance enrollments in different sections and things like this. So just keep on trying. It was All a right. nightmare. Lots of nightmares. It was a nightmare? I'm sorry. Power outages. Oh, um, shit. Took forever. An hour of torment. Yeah. 5.30 yeah, yeah, yeah. p.m. start time? That's, uh... Yeah. That's not cool. That's not cool. It kept, it kept crashing. It kept yeah. crashing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you haven't tried yet. Somebody says, I haven't tried yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I'm already starting to get lots of emails about uh, winter 1070 as well. So, um, so 7 to 10 p.m. physics. Really? I'm pretty sure physics changes. That Like, physical properties change at 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's been snowing since 4 a.m. Uh, do you believe this? Where are you? Yeah. That's cool. Okay. So... Let's get started. Uh, we have a long story to tell you, and it's a really cool story. And if we can tell it in the same class time, it becomes cooler, I hope. Um, and if it doesn't, it's also cool. It's also cool, yes. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, so. Oh, wait, we have to go back because we have because it's beautiful. You're going to take, you're going to yeah. save the screen. Okay, and then can you clear it for me? I can clear it for us. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I have a big personality, and sometimes it's, there's only room for one. <laughs> okay. Who's transcribing this? Did that? Yeah. Thank you, the big personality, and sometimes it, there's, there's a, only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it more clearly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, here we go. Serenity we now. We are going to tell you a very cool story. Um, a very, very cool story about a molecule. So finally, this is the molecule level. This is the class that we're going to talk about molecules, and we're going to talk about them in the context of physiology and adaptations or non-adaptations to the cold. Like, we are just bringing it all together in this pivotal class. So I... You're, you started <laughs> by saying we've lost all of our resources and rebuilt them from scratch, and now upping... Digging it up to say, like, it's only this. And it's like, or, or next class. Or next class. And no. a little bit of the one after In that. this one. No. We're going to get through this, Smith. Ready? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Because we're going to tell you. Teaching is not pouring content <laughs> down the pipes of the internet. Okay. We are going to tell you about hemoglobin. And we want you to think about hemoglobin. And we're going to tell you the tale of two hemoglobins. Um, very, very vertebrate bias in this story. Um, obviously, because hemoglobin is a thing of vertebrates. Um, do ants have... Uh, did you know that there's a homicide class? What? And it's restricted, which I'm <laughs> I'm glad about. That's awesome. Professor Dexter? Professor... <laughs> okay. Um, Stay first, on his good side. Okay, so we're going to tell it to you in two parts. Part one is about woolly mammoths, because they're awesome. Part two um, is about a germs. species that is even more cool than a woolly mammoth, but we won't tell you what it is. And that's a pun. 
Okay, so woolly mammoths and hemoglobin. It's an incredible story. Um, and so first, we have a question. What do you know about woolly mammoths? Please feel free to write stuff on and, and Google stuff if you want quickly. Um, let's just pepper this slide with facts or the chat with facts about woolly mammoths. <laughs> They're extinct. That's an important aspect. Thank you. <laughs> North American. Thick fur. <laughs> Ray. <laughs> no, Ray Romano. Ray I Romano. presume that was going yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ancestor of the, what is it? Of elephants. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. Yeah, they're hairy elephants. That's better, actually. That's a better. That's a better statement. They were alive when the ancient Egyptians were. You are absolutely right. Hunted by early humans. Yes. Uh, we have found usable samples. Oh my goodness, have we found usable and interesting samples? Big tusks. They look cool. Multiple species, not just one. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very well preserved. Ah, oh, cuties. Yes. Um, absolutely. Okay, good. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, they are herd animals. Yes, they are. Um, for sure, for sure. Okay, that's super. Great. So, we know some stuff. So, great. Now, we're going to teach you some other stuff. Um, because, amazing. Um, I'm going to clear all of this, and we are going to let the other people in. Hello, people coming in. We're talking about woolly mammoths, because they are awesome. Here are some things about woolly mammoths. So you were uh, right to identify North America as one of their, their habitats. Uh, also Eurasia, so super, super widespread. In fact, the distribution, we'll show you in a minute, is kind of uncanny, and we'll show you, we'll show you why. Um, several morphological adaptations to the cold, so these things were specifically and beautifully adapted to living in cold environments. Um, they are no longer with us um, and they were extirpated um, in sort of, um, you know, sort of groups or distinct populations. The population got smaller and smaller and smaller um, and more concentrated um, and uh, as opposed to like just a mass overall extinction, right? Those are sort of two different ways you can go extinct. It can be this like slow death or it can be this like more immediate one. For the, for the mammoths, it was a slow extirpation. You're pulling out all sorts of really cool stuff. So Smith is looking at some very cool videos um, because they're amazing. Um, and so hopefully we'll show those to you. Um, they were extinct as recently as 1700 years ago. So humans, as far as we know, have been on the planet for 195,000 years. Now we haven't been in North America for that long, um, but certainly our uh, ranges overlapped. Um, and uh, the answer to why they went extinct is probably, it's complicated. Um, it's probably multiple factors. Um, it, it's possible that there was a hunting pressure um, but also um, all sorts of things related to, to climate change. And this is the common ancestor. So this is the common ancestor of elephants and of uh, woolly mammoths. So woolly mammoths are not the ancestor of elephants. Um, this is. <laughs> um, and it's great. It's... And it's, when we say this, it's not the Charlie's Angels. No. <laughs> No, um, yeah, so um, it was it was just this, like, pig-like, you know, large pig size. No, don't you think? No, I would call it more tapir-like. Ta okay, tapir-like. Um, are tapirs related to this? Uh, no. No? It's huh. tapir-like. Okay, um, so tapir-like, but large tapir, um, and uh, this is it. So um, you can see already some sort of special functioning of the nose going on here that will eventually become a trunk. Um uh, it's at the Nature Museum in Ottawa, this one, or the Woolly Mammoth? Um, I think somebody's, yeah, okay, so it's on this slide, so I guess you mean, yeah, this one, cool, thanks, that's awesome. Um, we should uh, we should see if we can find uh, a photograph. I of... think this is Meritherium. Aha, oh, okay, okay, so there you go. And this is the story as far as we understand it. So everything today 
is in the green box. So we have the Asian and the African elephant. Um, and you can see that uh, the woolly mammoth are sister taxa. They are um, uh, closely related, but that the common ancestor is something that is neither, right? Okay, before we leave this, I think the other thing to emphasize is that we've got uh, African elephant lineages, but one of the things that we've learned in the past decade um, with genetics on isolated populations is that there's more than one species of African elephant. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So these cryptic things that I sometimes go on and on about, about little things, it's sometimes not little things alone, it's sometimes the biggest and the most iconic uh, witness elephants and giraffes. Giraffes, yeah. And orca. Yes. Cool. Or orangutans. I, okay. will keep, I will keep going. <laughs> so take a look at the distribution and the migration patterns. Or migration is, it, it's not migration. Range shift or range expansion patterns. That's what we should be calling it. Um, because it should look familiar. Um, because that kind of follows quite, or, well, precedes actually. Because if you take a look at the dates, uh, precedes um, another range expansion. And that is of humans. Um, and one of the one of the arguments, like for the cause of the human rage expansion, it has always been that they were following food, um, and so this pattern does agree with the following food hypothesis. Although recently, like as of maybe five years ago, and I've always said this, and everybody has always just said no, that's crazy. Um, somebody, um, so we found that. One of the explanations for human range expansion may very well have simply been curiosity um, and sort of this need to like push the boundaries and what's over that mountain, what's over that mountain kind of deal, which I always find delightful. Um, and apparently there is some genetic evidence to suggest that curiosity was selected for, which I think is awesome because yay, I may have been right, but certainly... No, a bit bigger than that, yay. What do you mean? Curiosity has been selected for. That speaks volumes to our right? the potential for our species. Right. And also you were right. And also I was right. So, ha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but. Oh, don't sum up with ha. <laughs> but supporting that curiosity may very well have been food, right? And so, yes, it is possible then um, that, you know, one of the supporters of the human range expansion was the range expansion of woolly mammoths. Um, or large, large mammals. Food, food, glorious food. Right. <laughs> and we see lots of evidence of that. So what I was going to say is, can you escape out of this? Yeah, I can. And Did you put in a video? Yeah, I did. Okay, wait. Um, and if this goes well... Yeah. Here, right? Okay, so like, can we start here again? Yeah, so because I want... These things are super moving. I don't know if, if you guys have had chances to see caves like this, uh, even reproductions of them, I, I find them incredibly moving to see traces of handprints. I couldn't believe, I burst into tears in one of these caves in France because there was right hands, right hands, right hands, and then all of a sudden a left hand. And I was like, that's me. <laughs> it's me. It's you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the right-handed people threw them under the feet of the mammoth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's quite remarkable to see these caves. And I've, I, my my parents live in France, and so I had the opportunity to to visit them. Um, the cave that I've visited that is the oldest is Fond de Gomme, and and it is an authentic one. So they do a lot of reproductions to in order to protect in order to protect from the original flashes one. and. Yeah algae that comes in like because you're bringing all sorts of stuff in that grows Moisture. on these caves yeah. as soon as yeah um but i did have the chance to go into like a real one and oh my goodness does it ever give you incredible shivers um but anyway so we know that that we have overlapped because we've taken photo with photos yeah. of them right with our smartphones at the time um to uh to document uh the overlap and the existence as well as their importance right we tend not to draw things that aren't important um, and so certainly, you know, drawing things that are important to you um, is, uh, is very likely at the time that these things were drawn uh, in order to, you know, to highlight their importance and their value. And even cavemen draw it better than you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but this is some of the information passing on, right? Like the, the, the species can be identified in these drawings because identifying things was important. Yeah. And, and... And that knowledge, this was part of how that, this was passing on the culture of how they did it, who did what in the in the process. And 
what worked and what didn't. Like yeah. there's a whole. This is really in. This was the richest. This was the internet of yeah. the day. And so they drawing better than you is is maybe just speaks to and me <laughs> maybe just speaks to the relaxing of the pressure that, that we don't have to I don't have to draw out our grocery list yeah and then we our family goes hungry if you can't interpret <laughs> this looked like a bagel but I brought home donuts and so like, oh, no. oh no so fun fact um, in the the French caves uh, cave system of cave paintings there is only one depiction of a human being so far. Um, and uh, the human being has uh, is very sort of tall, skinny, has the beak of a bird and a giant erection. So again, speaking to what was important. <laughs> uh, Think about cosplay. It. I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So what is this? We have metabolically. Yep. And this is not that long ago. This is not us talking about the Cambrian explosion. These are thousands. This is like a blink of time. Yep. Okay, so we don't have woolly mammoths anymore, but wouldn't it be cool? I think it would be cool. Um, and some people are thinking that it would be cool because there's a lot of research going on uh, on woolly mammoths because of the tissue preservation. So we're not talking about fossils, right? Um, which is simply just a representation of the pattern of existing tissue. This is the actual tissue, right? So it's a very different, very different scenario. And if actual tissue exists, so does the DNA. And the DNA, DNA as a molecule, if, if you think about, you know, one of the things that, that has allowed it to evolve uh, and to be so successful is its ability to self-preserve, right? So we can extract DNA from mammoths and, it, and read it. Now, there are some, there's some damage to it. But our technology allows us to be able to reconstruct, for example, the genome of woolly mammoths. Mind blowing! So cool. Okay. And um, more specifically, we have been focusing on, our research has been focusing on the hemoglobin of a woolly mammoth um, in particular. Um, and so we now have the full genome of the hemoglobin of a woolly mammoth. Um, and what we see are some very interesting cold adaptations just in that, um, in that molecule alone. And here's the story, if it works. Yeah. yeah. Now, before we start this one, it's yeah. kind of a boring story. It's not a boring story, it's boringly told. But yeah. we'll, we'll start out with this uh, uh, colleague from Manitoba. Who thinks he's a legend. Well, we'll and we'll stop it at some point. Yeah, okay. So a little, a little ego heavy here, but it's a good story. He's rightfully proud. Yeah. This is mammoth hemoglobin, a living, breathing molecule, which picks oxygen up in the lungs and delivers it to the tissues. It was synthesized in our lab, but it is no different than had I gone on a time machine 43,000 years into the past and taken a blood sample from a living, breathing mammoth. This is a special edition of Campus Cast, a University of Manitoba podcast. <laughs> the U of M has thousands of professors able to speak on just about any topic. The topic this week, mammoth blood. Physiologist Kevin Campbell has spent years toiling away in a lab to reconstitute mammoth hemoglobin. He succeeded. My colleagues met up with him to learn about his work, which was recently published in the journal Nature. At one point in the conversation, they are joined by chemist and study co-author Jörg Stettefeldt, we get into this woolly subject now. So where did the mammoth blood come from? Well, we created it, we resurrected it, we synthesized it from scratch. How do you do that? Well, it's a, it was a long haul. It started about nine years ago, in fact. Um, when I saw a TV show on, on mammoths and raising the mammoth, and they talked about you know, resurrecting mammoths, bringing them back, cloning them. And I knew enough about ancient DNA that this probably wasn't going to happen anytime soon. But it struck me, working with hemoglobin, that maybe, just maybe, we could, we could bring back the sequences, the DNA sequences from a mammoth. Because, you know, in their bones and in their hair and in the pulp of their teeth, DNA survives. But there's a problem with that DNA. Uh, it's thousands and thousands of years old. And it's been damaged by ice crystals, it's been damaged by water, oxidation. And it's in many tiny little fragments, and uh, I simply didn't have the, uh, the wherewithal or the lab you know, to do this type of work. So I contacted uh, Alan Cooper, at, uh, then at Oxford, 
and simply proposed to him that I wanted to resurrect mammoth hemoglobin. And I explained, you know, that I was a physiologist and I really didn't have uh, this background. But, you know, I said, is it possible to get these gene sequences from the mammoth? And, and he thought about it for a few seconds and said, I can't see why not. And, you know, he thought, you know, this is fantastic. He, he'd never heard of anything like this. Okay. So clearly excited about this. And this was a big, this is a big deal, right? Yeah. He's, um, it's, it's right that he's excited about it. And, yeah. and when I kind of roll my eyes, I roll my eyes at the communications department of the university that like just plunks the camera and says, okay, talk. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a good stage. Don't. Yeah. Good. And, and then you edit it. Yeah. So, so <laughs> this, this is not eye rolling at Kevin Campbell, not on my part anymore. No, but, good scientist. Yeah. Interesting form of communication. Um, and so here's the story, right? Hemoglobin, in order to be able to accept and then to offload oxygen, needs to move. The molecule itself physically has to move, okay? So it goes like this, right? If this is your hemoglobin here, uh, in order to onload and offload hemoglobin, it's got to move. And one of the things that uh, has been noticed uh, is that in the context of a cold environment, it takes more energy to cause that movement, right? This is just kind of basic physics, right? You need more energy and cold in order to get the molecule to move. And so one of the questions was if there are cold adaptations at the molecular level in woolly mammoths, is it possible uh, that there are adaptations to um, the mechanics of hemoglobin? And so that was what they were testing. Um, yeah, so here we go. We're moving, and the oxygen is represented by this teal uh, dot where my uh, cursor is right now. And you can see that it's, it's, it's switching between the oxy and the deoxy, or the deoxygenated state, uh, based on a simple movement, right? Um, and so think about this, when we're talking about any kind of adaptations to the cold at the level of hemoglobin, what level of organization are we talking about? Moving on from there, um, here we go with some hypothesis and some prediction testing. And what I want you to do is, is come up with a prediction. Here's your hypothesis. Woolly mammal hemoglobin had properties that allowed it to function in cold extremities and in their appendages, right? Despite having a warmer core temperature. So this talks about regional heterothermy, the fact that some parts of the woolly mammoth are going to be colder than others at the extremities of the appendages. What might we then predict about hemoglobin if this hypothesis is true? What could we look for? Um, to see whether or not this is a, a true hypothesis or the hypothesis is supported. What can we predict? Concentration across the body. Oh, that's interesting. In the torso. That's super interesting. So, like, if hemoglobin doesn't work in the extremities, it's not there. That's fascinating. It's not, it's, it's, yep, we could test that for sure. Nice. It can function both in hot or cold. Very good. Higher glucose. Enzymes that can function at lower temperatures, forming around brown fat similar properties to other cold dwelling vertebrates. That's yeah. interesting. All of these things, all of them are interesting. So brown fat may be like distributed into the extremities in order to provide heat for the hemoglobin. I love it. Yes, yes, hard. I, I know this is hard. This was a challenging one. Uh, since it is a protein, it will start to denature earlier than standard hemoglobin. That's super interesting. Genes encode different types of hemoglobin. Very good. Okay. Yes. 
all of these things are entirely testable. Some of them are going to not be demonstrated to be true in this context, but there is nothing wrong with your predictions. They do support the hypothesis and they are testable and therefore they are correct predictions. What we will tell you is what actually was found, but again, it doesn't negate any of, of the things that you have said. Um, and that's a really important thing to know because what you know happened in this case of the mammoth may be an isolated case, right? So one of the things that has been found, um, I'm just going to clear everything here, um, is here we go. the prediction that was made by Kevin Campbell and the rest of the um, and the rest of the team was that woolly mammoth hemoglobin structure will be more similar to that of Arctic mammals than to the hemoglobin structure of closely related tropical elephants. So one of you actually nailed it yeah. to say that it would be more similar to other Arctic vertebrates, right? And if that's the case, well done again. But the other one's also good and nothing, testable and testable. And that nothing was the, wrong that's with the main it. Yeah. victory. Okay. Um, uh, and so taking a look, uh, we can do a bit of an experiment, right? We can take a look at existing hemoglobin structures of Arctic and Antarctic, presumably uh, vertebrates. Um, and we can, one of you said, let's test its uh, activity in different temperatures. So again, this totally supports all of those, uh, those, different, um, uh, those, those, those different predictions support the same hypothesis. Um, and this one here is an, an experiment that was done to take a look uh, at measuring the ability of the reconstructed hemoglobin to bind over a wide temperature range, right? Um, and indeed, what they found was that woolly mammoth hemoglobin can offload at lower temperatures. Um, and so it doesn't require the same amount of energy. And that's because of a small difference um, in the way that it is constructed that allows it to be able to, um, to offload oxygen at lower temperatures than a hemoglobin molecule from more temperate or, or warmer adapted okay. animals. How small? Three amino acids. Cool. Yeah. Super small. Super small difference. Big effect. Yeah. So that's the story. It's cool, I think. It's kind of, yeah, super neat. And now we want to contrast that against another story about hemoglobin. Um, Can we say goodbye for a second with some questions that have come up yes, in there with the mammoths? Is that, are there people trying to reconstruct mammoths? There, there for sure are. There are genetics labs, because since this has happened, this is 2010, uh, that, that Campbell and others did this work. There have been complete mammoth, multiple complete mammoth genomes published and sequenced. So we know to the base pair kind of how different they are from contemporary lineages. And with the advent of CRISPR, there, there are people who think that this is a doable thing and that are trying to, that are trying to do it. Uh, which becomes a, then an interesting question about uh, that that people have in step and taiga based countries where where they think okay so this was a big part of those environments the disruption the physical m manipulation of the environment by these large herbivores what's happened to them as we know them now in the absence of these large weighty herbivores what might they look like if they returned it's it's kind of a neat it's it's science fictiony but it's uh, it's being worked at. Oh, how can one get into a career with doing things like genetic reanimation? Most rapidly, science fiction. <laughs> and then yeah. second, most rapidly, uh, work <laughs> work with labs that use CRISPR, and there's there are yeah. labs on campus that do that. Yep, yep. There, it is entirely possible. Um, it, it you know it exciting careers and again like very slow to progress careers right you're not gonna probably in your lifetime be able to create a jurassic park like for reals um but it can be really cool remember though when the the, the um so when kevin was talking about um uh how long it took it took nine years to convince people to even think about the idea so you have to be you know a certain level of privilege to be able to hold off for that for that long and, it, and it's also the fact that the technology they could do it now what's going to take long is the permission to do it that's right there are a million ethical 
things. So actually, a fast way into that world is to go into um, bioethics um, and start there because a lot of work needs to be done there before anything actually happens in labs. Okay, now a way better species, I think. <laughs> the Antarctic fish. Does anybody, have you heard of the Antarctic ice fish? This is what it looks like when it's teeny tiny, but the reason why uh, we're showing you this is because it's translucent, <laughs> which is amazing to me. Um, and it's called an ice fish because it really is lacking in all sorts of color, right? Um, and it really does look extremely pale um, when even when it grows up into something that's a little bit bigger. So it looks more kind of like like white glue <laughs> uh, in its appearance. Um, and they call it an ice fish, obviously, because the way, the way it looks. If I asked you what you knew about ice fish, my guess is that we would have even fewer things than woolly mammoths. No, there's people excited in the there's chat. There's people excited? Yay! Okay. Uh, and they're yeah, already using the pun. They're already telling. Yay. Okay. So some of you know about ice fish. Wonderful. Okay. So they live in really cold waters. Um, they are um, pretty slow moving. They're not like one of the most energetic fish, um, but they are a dominant fish in Antarctica. Um, and so uh, there are uh, 16 species. Their population sizes are quite you know healthy, quite large, um, and they do kind of dominate uh, that particular fishy niche of, uh, of Antarctic waters. The fish. The fish, the fishy niche. Um, okay, and... They're weird. They're weird! Like... Like, totally like weird. Like, look at that bullet. No hemoglobin. None. Which... <laughs> which is just messed up. I mean, there are other proteins, or there are other things that you can carry oxygen with. The arthropod kingdom is full of different things. But yeah, but they don't have any of that. This, this is a vertebrate. This is kind of, this is in the lineage of where, where, which is doubled down on hemoglobin as, your, as the yeah. molecule with which you carry oxygen. And then it's like, eh. No, like, it's by osmosis. Like, seriously. Like, for reals, it's by osmosis, the way that it gets into their body. And then it doesn't get transported, which is messed up. So take a look at their blood. Down here on the left-hand vial uh, is ice fish blood. <laughs> That's what it looks like. This is like all other vertebrate blood, right? Or in this case, another fish blood uh, for comparison. Take a look at their gills. B on the top up here, that's ice fish gills. C is like other fish gills. Um, Super oxygenated. I mean, yeah. clearly in the gills where you're moving things back and forth, you're trying to get the oxygen out of the water. That's where you put the blood. The blood's filled with hemoglobin. It's red. Except if you're an ice fish, when it looks like that. Gross. So pe tea. people got really excited about this, right? How can a vertebrate live without hemoglobin? You can think about a million medical applications, right? All sorts of interesting things um, that would be really interesting to pursue. And it launched a whole bunch of research. A very good a colleague, a very good friend of mine um, uh, did his PhD on exactly this particular challenge, right? Why? what's going on here, this is messed up. And if you take a look at the subsequent adaptations and physiological responses to not having hemoglobin, it's remarkable. Um, so they have way more blood uh, than you would predict uh, for a fish their size. They have really large blood vessels. They have a massive heart. Um, and they're just pumping they're volumes of so blood. Giving. They're so giving, yeah. Volumes of blood throughout their body. They are physiological sort of chimera monsters, right? In terms of, um, in terms of their adaptations uh, as a result of the loss of hemoglobin. And they're kind of unique in the world, right? Um, if we take a look at um, at a clade or a, a, a particular sort of area of uh, fish evolution. Uh, we see here, these are the Antarctic fishes, so there are other fishes, um, and it's only within this group of ice fishes that we see this hemoglobin loss, okay? And that's an important thing to note, that there are other Antarctic fish that have hemoglobin, okay? So just kind of think about that. So basically what I can conclude from looking at this particular graph or this particular chart is that living in Antarctica doesn't require the loss of hemoglobin, OK? 
okay because there are other things that have that have uh, hemoglobin that are extant so they're living right now in Antarctic waters I mean, what are you reading you're reading draconian modifications that's how amazing some uh, yeah, physiologists that's describe. cool okay um, yeah so we're focused here on the ice fish um, for now, uh, here's some other things. These are the antifreeze proteins that appear here. So it is common uh, to all of them. So for me, that would signal that if all of the Antarctic fish have it, then it's probably a necessary thing, right? Um, but that's not the case here. So just think about how you might be able to interpret those things relative to the ecology and to the environment, right? It's like a super powerful tool. And remember, go back for a second, this is also a, a chance for you to think about how you're designing questions because we're talking about molecules, but we're plotting them on a phylogeny and then asking you about the ecology. So we've got the appearance of antifreeze, we've got secondary loss in some species in that top family with the green, and then a new, uh, the appearance of a new trait. The only time this has happened in, ver in vertebrates that we know of ever in the, in the ice fish. So oh. there's a whole bunch that can come out of a, a plot like that. Oh, so like a potential true statement about this graph, maybe something like um, it's possible that those from the nautothin 80 that, um, uh, that don't have antifreeze proteins live in warmer waters, right? Um, and so play that again if you want when you, when you uh, listen to the recording. But you can see that secondary loss, right, in some species of this family, not all of them, therefore there must be something different about where they live, right, would be a logical inference. It could be another thing, but, um, but certainly that would be supported by this. And tying into data. The, the way that we have of telling stories evolutionarily, that evolution is not by the accumulation of complexity, it's often by a, the loss of things. Right. Another true statement might be that some of those uh, species of the nautothinidae um, uh, use other ways of, uh, of not freezing, right? They may have like high glucose levels or they may do other things, right? I don't know the answer to this question. Are they commercially fished? Yes. Is that because we eventually commercially fish everything? Yes. It, it's it, it, They're tasty. I've, I've eaten them. I think uh, you're not technically allowed to eat them. Uh, unless they've been harvested for scientific reasons kind of deal, like they're one of those loophole fish. And it's also because this, this property, our discovery of it is relatively recent, like the 50s, 1950s. So it's, yeah. it's, we've been fishing in that region for a lot longer. So I wondered yeah. about uh, if we, as we fish our way down in ideal yeah. catch, it's like, okay, let's eat that too. Yeah. That was a good question on there about the tree. Where did it start? And sometimes you look at the tree. It was a question that was an annotation on the slide. Where did it start? And it would have just been the out group would have been the most uh, next most related group of fish. Yes. Probably. But sometimes you show what the, what's called an unrooted tree. And that's what this would be. That's what this is? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Now, Smith, we're going to have to do this together. Because when I look at this, <laughs> um, when I look at B, I'm like, mm, done, no, moving on. When I look at A, I see some things, right? So, for example, can an ice fish regain hemoglobin? Is it possible, right? And what this suggests is that over time in the 14 ice fishes, this is the fragment here for hemoglobin, for example. This is how I interpret it. And then if we, this is like in a fish that has hemoglobin. And then here, if we go down here, the 14 ice fishes, this is what's left of that part of the genome that's associated with the hemoglobin molecule. And to me, this is so damaged and deleted that it would be impossible for a fish, for an ice fish to re-evolve the trait of having hemoglobin. Does that make sense? Yeah, so take a look at this and think back to when we were talking about flightlessness in birds uh, and in insects, and we compared and contrasted yeah. that. And in the insect example, we talked about how in some lineages, I think of the walking stick, that flightlessness came and went, that they would, they would, and that was partially because the genetic underpinning that made that feature, even when it was lost in a, lin in a lineage, the, the genetic architecture was actually still there. It would, just wasn't expressed. And what this is showing is exactly what you said, which is it's gone. And so the likelihood of it re-evolving uh, re or re-emerging 
And so could they, in a warming climate, is it still there for them to return to? This suggests no, that it's, it's snipped out and it's gone. Right. So, and, they've, and they're, they're reaping some benefits for that because they're not making all of that architecture. That's right. And there's no motivation to conserve or preserve genetic code that isn't actively being used, right? Uh, yeah. So it gets and damaged and lost over time. It gets damaged, yeah. So And so we do have lots of what people call um, junk DNA or regions, and that's what that great, like regions where it does some things and maybe it's there's some spacing uh, in its chromosomal architecture that's important, but we don't really understand what's going on. Right. But here, it's even lost that. And so even the scaffold to put the bricks in to build the house of hemoglobin is gone. So I think you got it nailed. What about genetic flow? If the ice fish populates with oh with Good a question. fish with hemoglobin, so nice. so we bring in the polar bear and the grizzly bear and say so what if you mix things up? That's and so so here we're gonna give you some more information that will hopefully um, make some sense. If the ice fish is exposed to chemical mutagens, anything is possible. Yes. And again, yes, especially yeah. in the Marvel or the DC universe, <laughs> there'll be Captain Ice Fish. Amazing. Okay, so here was a paper that was published about the ice fish and about a whole bunch of other things, like a, a, a other things about the ice fish, not just specifically focusing on hemoglobin, but also focusing on the adaptations that resulted from the loss of hemoglobin, right? But one of the interesting things about this paper is that they really only talk about it in the context of adaptation, right? So you see something really cool in nature and you're like, Oh my goodness, I wonder what the benefit is. I wonder how it evolved. What is the adaptation to that? And it's really, really important uh, to think about the other possibilities, the other mechanisms, the other hypotheses related to the evolution of a particular trait. Okay, so is it adaptive or is it something else? Is it non adaptive, for example? So here are a bunch of questions. Please share your ideas, either put them on the slide. There's not a lot of white space, but if you'd like to uh, put them in the chat, what are some of the other possible explanations for the lack of hemoglobin if it's not adaptive? Mutation, yes, definitely mutation. Thoughts in here as well about mutation. Okay. Random. Random, yeah. Mutation turned into an adaptation from sensories of isolation under the Antarctic ice. Yeah. Spaniel, random chance. Yeah. Super detrimental to them, so the mutation got passed on regardless. Whoever said Spaniel, I, I wonder if you've been reading some Gould, <laughs> and if you haven't, we talked about Wonderful Life last week, and if you haven't, you'll love it. Yeah. Uh, never developed hemoglobin. That's interesting. And also the difference between developed or evolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isolated breeding populations, super good. Sexual selection, interesting. Um, and it developed a more adaptive trait that made hemoglobin unnecessary. Fabulous. Not true at all, but brilliant. Um, super. Okay, yes. So all of these are possible. All of these are testable. The mutation thing is a little kind of, it, it, it's a little basic because it, yes, right? I mean, mutations can explain adaptive and non-adaptive traits. And so it, that's kind of that, like they precede uh, adapt, adaptation and non-adaptation. And so the answer is yes, irrespective. So it doesn't help distinguish between the two. I hope, I hope that, that that's clear. Um, it's the other things, right? The mechanisms of things, right? The, the genetic drift, for example, the bottleneck effects and all of those things that are really important um, in this particular context. I love some of the creative, like out of the box thinking because it's good. Like maybe they just never evolved hemoglobin, which would change the evolutionary tree that we presented though, because all of those other things do have it, right? Um, if they didn't, then they would be like an outgroup of fish, basically. Like it would yeah, be and remember, we, in the in the evolution group, we talked a lot about a little bit about parsimony, about saying that yeah. okay, if that if we're going to presume that or hypothesize what you just did, that become we need more steps to make 
yeah. to explain what we see today. Yeah. So it doesn't make it wrong. Nope. It just says, okay, if we're going to follow that line of reasoning, we're going to need more, more things to have happened. And sometimes more things is less likely. That's right. So somebody wanted to rethink a little bit this sort of adaptive lens that we put on everything and ask. I love this title. Yes. <laughs> when bad things happen to good fish. Now, here's where the ecology, the physiology, the evolution come like crashing into one species in such a remarkable and cool way, right? Instead of thinking that the loss of hemoglobin is an adaptation, think about it as being maladaptive, but something that isn't so bad that it doesn't kill you because your environment is facilitating it. Okay, so one of you did actually put, you know, wasn't so bad, so it, you know, so it allowed uh, to evolve. You're correct, right? But the, the loss of hemoglobin in any other context but Antarctic waters would be catastrophic, right? Like there's no way that you could survive. The only reason why the ice fish can survive is because Antarctic water, cold water, is hyper oxygenated compared to warm water because of the physical properties of water um, and because of the physical properties of cold water. Cold water is sluggish. The molecules are sluggish. And it means that there are more spaces around the molecules, which means that cold water can just hold more stuff. More stuff in this particular case is oxygen. And so cold water has more oxygen than warm water. That's why and like when you put uh, water on your stove to boil, right? The bubbles start to come up. That's oxygen being released as the water is heating up, right? So cold water has more oxygen. And because it has more oxygen, these fish can survive with osmosis. It's also <laughs> as why, being the way that they get oxygenated. It's also why you would never, ever choose to make coffee or tea with warm water. Because <laughs> you need the oxygen there. That's part of what gives you the tastes that you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, so just bananas, right? very likely affected by all sorts of really interesting sort of evolutionary history that facilitated this really bad mutation, right? Uh, we are out of time, and so we'll stop there. Um, but we will pop this up um, for you and ask you to read it for homework. Um, and I, I can uh, guarantee that there will be future questions related to it, its interpretation. So this pretty much tells the story of the genetic mechanisms and the evolutionary mechanisms by which this particular lack of hemoglobin evolved. So as we leave, uh, some of you may have seen in the news this, the note, Darwin's missing notes. Oh. This is some of the notes that are missing, is this sketch of the first phylogeny. Which, uh, so if you've uh, done an interlibrary loan with Cambridge University and you have Darwin's so original notes, yeah. oh. or, or they're missing. Yeah. Oh my. So this is not good. So we have copies, but copies are not the same thing. So, uh, so let's bring them back. Yeah. Here's some homework. Um, you may want to rewatch this video in order to, to start filling it out. But I feel like if you do it, I, I've heard from other students that it's very helpful to understand, you know, it starts off really basic. And then it gets a little bit more complicated, but the idea is to kind of build on the difference associated with these two case studies that will hopefully kind of illuminate um, some of the, the more important sort of consequences and implications for the two different stories. We hope that you've enjoyed them. Take care. Take care of each other. Yep. And uh, we will be back in a few minutes for our student hours. And if we don't see you then, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>